rain, Lord, rain, Lord. Hallelujah. I'm glad to be in a apostolic house where the presence of the Lord is, where his spirit is. Hallelujah. Where his people are. Hallelujah. Almost got me there. I almost said where his people is. But where, well, I don't know. I'll refer to the, the, uh, the English teacher later and <laughs> ask. <laughs> Amen. I'm glad to be in his house tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. Why don't we clap our hands to the Lord one more time? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. It's good to be in his house tonight. It's fullness of joy. Amen. I was looking forward. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Amen. I was looking forward to church tonight. Amen. To see what the Lord would do. Amen. And I believe he's here tonight to do something special. Amen. For every one of us. Amen. We're praying for those that are sick. Brother Seeley. Pray for Sister Hall, pray for Kelly, pray for all of those names that were listed at the beginning of service. Amen. Believe that God is going to continue to work. Pray for Pastor. Amen. God will touch his body. Amen. Well, turning in our Bibles to Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Good spirit of worship and presence of the Lord in this service tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm glad I came to church. What about you? Be renewed, refreshed by his spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. And by his word. So I'm eager to get into the word of the Lord tonight. Let it wash over my soul tonight. Amen. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. If you have it, say amen. It says, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Amen. Why don't we lay down our Bibles and ask the Lord to help us in the remainder of this service. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, for your presence that I feel in this house tonight. Thank you, Lord. God, for your faithful children of God. I pray, Lord, that you would bless each and every one of these folks, God, that have come to your house tonight. Let your word find its mark in our hearts, God. We come eager to hear from you, God, to mix with faith, God, your precious word. In the mighty name of Jesus, why don't we clap our hands to the Lord one more time before we're seated. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, I think I just drank after Brother Larson, Lord. Oh, it wasn't yours. Okay, somebody else's. God bless you. You could be seated. <laughs> I'll open a new one just in case. Sanctified already. It's in the house of the Lord. Amen. Anyway, um, well, we talked about last week the first lesson, God-fearing, and, and I want to just get as quickly as we can into lesson two tonight. I mean, the Lord has been uh, stirring my heart and teaching me some things, and I just want to share these, what I've learned with you. Is that all right? Is that all right if I could share what I've learned with you? I mean, we talked about last week the book of Acts being the historical account, and I just want to use this as a, a, a manner of introduction tonight. I don't, want to get, I don't want to cover everything we talked about last night, but, or last week, but, um, but this was a period uh, of uh, that the book of Acts was a historical account about the early church and anything you want to know about the apostolic church, the way it was founded, the way it ought to operate, uh, you can find within the pages of the book of Acts and how the apostles uh, performed, what they did, the decisions they made, and, and uh, it gets into explicit detail. And then you can read in, in the later epistles and find out um, specific situations and how they handled each of those, but the development of the church, the structure of the church, and, and what uh, essential components were in the church are all defined in the book of Acts, and we talked last week about uh, the, the first revival, the, the very first outpouring of, 
of God's Spirit. In Acts chapter 2 and 38, where then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It was the first apostolic message that was preached, of course, and we all know this. Amen. And then later on, 3,000 souls were added to the church. 5,000 souls were added to the church. But all the while, there was persecution going on. And um, they were having revival while they were having persecution. They were having, as we read in our text, rest while they were being persecuted. They were, having, um, edi they were being edified. They were being built up. The, the word of God was teaching them. They were becoming stronger in the faith while they were being persecuted. And then also they were multiplying. So while they were being persecuted. So persecution, we, while we are going into a, perhaps a season, I've heard Bishop talk about this in, in um, numerous ways and numerous times, but, and I believe it. I believe the end of the book. We know, amen, that there are, per, that, uh, that troubling times are ahead of us, that we are entering into the last of the last days. Brother Larson has already men mentioned it tonight. Amen. But I am here to tell you tonight and to remind this church, this good people of God, that, that while we are being persecuted, and it doesn't matter the extent to which we are being persecuted, even to the point of martyrdom and death, that we can still see revival. Amen. Hallelujah. I, we talked last week about the story of growth and what real growth was through the illustration of the story of pastor in Canyon City, how he drove by that raccoon. It was getting bigger, but it wasn't growing. It was dead. Amen. And that we don't, we don't want to, we don't want to just get bigger in number, but we want to grow spiritually. We want to have the necessary rest when we come into the house of the Lord. We want to be edified when we come into the house of the Lord. And then we want to multiply. We don't want just uh, us far and no more. But, but in fact, when we do, amen, achieve that necessary uh, status in the, uh, as, as, a as Paul said to the Ephesian church, until we come to the measure of the stature of the full of Christ when we achieve that that status and and I believe that I'm, I'm sure amen there's always room to grow amen and there's always an opportunity for us to grow but but when we get to that place then we should multiply and and reproduce after our kind as the as is principally taught uh, throughout scripture but I don't believe that this is just a formula for revival man there there is no one plus one, two plus two, two times two, that equals X or Y or, or Z. We're not doing math tonight. This is a spiritual endeavor. What is going on in this place even tonight, the Spirit of God that has already moved in this place has a specific purpose and intention. And every one of you are not on these pews by accident. You're here by divine purpose and intention. Every one of you play a, an important and distinct role within the body of Christ. We've talked about that in the past, but for the purpose of, of edification, being edified, that you can learn more, that you can do more, that you can grow in the, in the house of the Lord, but then later that you would multiply and that others would come uh, as a result of your own efforts. <laughs> Hallelujah, men. But I do uh, believe that there were certain criteria that were that that are specified within that early Christian church that 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 if we don't get this into this church that if we if we don't seek and strive to emulate this to reflect this to replicate this in our in our church then we won't see the kind of rest and edification and multiplication that they found but but if we can attain these these two simple things and i believe that that the same rest that that came and visited the early church uh, and on the day of pentecost and and in those later services that we read about throughout scripture that 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 same rest that peace uh, that passes all all understanding can visit you and me in this sanctuary. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And those two essential components of the early church, I believe, are both the, the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Ghost. And so we began looking last week at the fear of the Lord. 
I think it's interesting that, that the writer tells us that they were walking. They weren't running. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a race. They weren't trying to um, outdo or outmaneuver another church down the street. They were just walking steadily, steadfast, if you will, just carefully walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. And last week, I, I gave some personal stories as by way of introduction to get us along the same minds, to, to bring our thoughts together on the same point. I believe the Lord helped us last week and, and helped us get to that point. But tonight, I want to take, uh, to allow Scripture to help us define what, what a genuine fear for God is or what it ought to be. And uh, I... I I've done careful study, and I could have missed it. I, I, I mean, I could have missed some things. But I do believe that after uh, carefully going through the entire New Testament, not that I sat down and read all the New Testament, but I, I went and, and um, you Bible students will know what I'm talking about when I talk about a word study. I, I read and studied every verse, and I'm not patting myself on the back. I just want you to understand um, the, the, uh, the background here that, that I read every verse that the word fear appears, specifically uh, the Greek word phobos. And we'll talk a little bit more about it here in just a minute. But that was translated as fear in the New Testament. And I believe I have a firm standing on, on what I believe the God-fearing ought to be in the New Testament church today. And that we ought to strive in, with every part of our being as an individual Christian living in the New Testament church uh, to, uh, to attain, uh, amen, an appropriate and healthy and godly fear. Hallelujah. And I think that if we don't, that, that the alternative is, is detrimental. But if we can, amen, great things are in store in general. Within the New Testament, there are two, as far as I could find, basic words. Now, there are iterations of these words, um, various forms of the same word, but two root words, if you will, that are interpreted as fear. And I don't want to get into both of them right now. We'll mention both of them in just a minute. But in, in most cases, when you read the word fear in the New Testament, you are you are reading a word that, is, that means literally what you think of today, which is to be, in, to be afraid or to be stricken with terror. That's what it means. That's what the word means. That's why it's there. And so, it, Fabas, you might be able to, um, might be able to, rec I, I'm, I'm already, I'm getting ahead of myself, but you might think the word Fabas, it, it, it seems, sounds very similar to another English word that's, that's pretty common nowadays phobia and you know I don't, I'm not I'm not the Greek you know theologian that Bishop is but but it could be I, and he might be able to tell me off the top of his head whether or not this is the root word but it, they seem linked and that that they they come from the same origin but but I want you to understand that that that's that is exactly what is trying to be conveyed when you read the word fear it is literally a fear it is a terror but a terror to what end a fear to what end, afraid for what end. Everything in the scripture is, is there with a purpose. And there are countless times it appears um, in scripture at the binding and loosing of, of, of Zechariah's his mouth when, when he met with the angel and the angel um, bound his tongue and he couldn't talk anymore. The Bible says that when he saw the angel, he was afraid. It's the same, it's, that's that word, fear. And then when his tongue was loose and the Bible says that those that were there they became afraid because of the miracle of the loosening of Zacharias's uh, uh, tongue we'll, we'll look at Ananias and Sapphira a little bit later but when that story transpired there was a literal fear that gripped the crowd that was watching on that day the sons of Sceva when they when they tried to overthrow the spirits of of hell that that the Bible says that that spirit overcame them and fear came on all those that were watching. Talking about real fear. The Bible says on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 and 43 that, that this is not fear of the Lord. This is just a basic concept, terror. Fear gripped the hearts of those that were looking on. I don't know if it was because of the substantive change in the lives of those that were there, but something occurred 
that day that caused fear to strike the hearts of those that were, that were looking on. When Jesus walked on the sea, the disciples were afraid. When Jesus healed the sick of the palsy and he said, your sins be forgiven you, it struck fear in the crowd. The healing of the man of the, of the demoniac of Gadara. Fear gripped those when they saw that this man was liberated from, from his uh, bondage. And, and many other times that we talked last week about repentance producing fear. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11. So fear is a necessary component. But, but what, why? Why is fear so important? Why is fear uh, such an important component in this new text. Are you, are you telling me, Brother Jared, that you ought to go around being scared all the time? Are, 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 you, are you saying that you ought to be timid or uh, unsure of yourself? Well, I, I hope that that's not what you, and, and by the time I'm finished tonight, I hope that's not what you take away from this. Um, but we, as, as human beings, we are given this emotional, this emotional attribute of fear, every single one of us. And um, fear is one of those natural human emotions that, that I believe is innate within every one of us. Some have learned to suppress it. Some have learned to overcome it, many to their detriment. Um, but also some, you know, you have to overcome, you know, certain fears if you want to mature in life. And so it's necessary. It's a part of growth in some ways. But if that emotion, if that fear that is a part of everybody's life that everybody knows about is misappropriated, then it can, it can gender a, a fear for things that, that I don't believe are, are, are good for a child of God. The um, Bible tells us a story in Jonah. We'll, we'll start here. Jonah chapter 1, verse 9 says, And he said unto them, I am in Hebrew. You know the story of Jonah where he was a preacher called by God and he refused to go and then he ran away to Tarsus and, uh, and, and, and then he, was, he, he caught, on, uh, caught up with a ship and they went out to sea. And during, while they were on, sea, on the sea, a storm came, tempest came and started to blow on that sea and and. And you have Jonah, a God-called preacher, and then you have these heathen men who have nothing to do with God all, at all. And, and so these men, they start having a conversation with Jonah in the middle of the storm. And, the, and Jonah tells them, I am in Hebrew, and he says, I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. So he's, he's kind of pointing to the answer. It's like, they're asking, why, why is there a storm coming? Why are we being, and he said, well, I serve, I'm a Hebrew, and I serve the God who created the seas and the land. I, I'm the one that, I, I serve the God that I believe created the sea and the land, and therefore, he's using this as a, as a judgment against me, because I'm, I'm not doing what I ought to be doing. And so, and, and you just gotta, you gotta, Get with me in the same mind of, the, of these guys. They're on this ship, and it's tossing to and fro. And what's going on, John? And John, well, I fear God. And, and he's the one that, and so he's probably the one that sent this tempest, this storm. And the next verse tells us that immediately, that it, it doesn't say immediately, but in this next scripture, it says, Then were the men exceedingly afraid. This, this innate sense of fear gripped their hearts. And, they, and these were heathen men. These were not men who had studied the Hebrew Bible, don't know who Moses is. They don't know anything about Abram. They're just living their lives on the sea. And this man comes along and, and he says, well, I serve a God. Now, this is just one among many to these guys. It's just, this is just another God. But, but, but. Jonah, the one that introduced these men to this God, said, I fear him. So somehow, I don't know what it was in what Jonah said, but it gripped their hearts, and the Bible says that they became exceedingly afraid. And said unto them, why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then said they unto him, what shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm to us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. 
And you know the rest of the story. He was thrown over. He said, throw me overboard. It'll be as soon as they threw him overboard. I don't know if these men were converted in that moment or not. But I do know what the Bible says is that they they achieved this sense of fear for the God who created the sea and created the land. And and so I believe that with this simple illustration that 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 fear is a is innate with every one of us, those of us who believe God and those of us who don't believe God. And, but it's there for a purpose. And the purpose is so that we, those of us who do believe in God, can communicate to those who don't believe in God that there is a God who created the sea, who created the land, who has control over everything. And if you just watch, just watch my God and how he operates, that he will meet your need. Hallelujah, I didn't come here really to preach that, but, but that one is free of charge. I just want you to understand that, that even these heathen men received a revelation of the need for their fear for a God who created and put all things into place. Hallelujah. Amen. But if we, like these heathen men, now again, God was just an, the, the one God of the ages for us, the eternal God, the only one God. Here is the Lord of God is one Lord. There, there's no other God in our minds. And for Jonah. But for these men, they're pagans. They, they, they believe the sun's of God, the moon's of God, the, the seas of God, the, the whales of God, all these different, all these different types of gods exist. So this is just another God. And um, in Acts chapter 17, Paul addresses a group of folks who, who have this same type of fear. That is, it's not really oriented well. It's there. They believe in some being beyond this world, but, but it is not quite honed in to the correct fear that it ought to be. It's not mature to, to where it ought to be. So he stands up on, on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17, verse 22. Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. And then he goes on to teach them about what he referred to or, or what they have referred to as the unknown God. And Bishop has talked about, he showed a picture of from his vantage point on top of Mars Hill, the very various uh, Athenian gods, all these different the various Greek gods that, that existed there in Athens, that these temples, and, and perhaps that was in the mind of Paul when he stood there and said, you guys, are, you guys, are, you guys aren't honing this thing right. You, you need to take a look at, at this one that you're calling the unknown God. What has this God ever done for you? What has Zeus ever done for you? You could tell the stories and, and, and perhaps some of you believe them, but there's, there's this untempered fear that is not restricted to the one who really is what it was designed for in the first place. Uh, you're scared that Zeus will zap you from above. You're scared that, that all of these other gods will, will bring this, uh, bring judgment upon you. But, but what I want to talk to you about is the unknown God to whom you should really play your fear if we misappropriate I'm here to tell this church and this generation that if we don't get it right if we just allow our our, our fear to to go wherever it ought to go and, and oh well I heard this and I thought this and somebody told me this uh, then all we are is just a superstitious people but if we can develop the right sense of fear and orient it toward the one being who created us, uh, who instantiated that emotion in us uh, in the first place, uh, then uh, and only then uh, have we become truly God-fearing. Some might call it superstitious. Those who look at us as being, uh, you know, they, they have no distinction between our God and many others. And so for them... They, they call us superstitious. They think we're, we're just crazy people. But we're not. We, it's, it, is a, it is a fear that I believe, it is an emotion that I believe was designed with a, an explicit purpose to serve the one that created us, who holds all authority, 
that has all power in heaven and in earth, that everything, the very breath, amen, that flows in and out of your lungs, the very words and the, the thoughts that form those words, who he originated those things, that's who we fear. It's more than just superstition. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm, I'm going somewhere tonight and, and we're, I'm just, I'm not really in too much of a rush. Amen. I've got a few more weeks to go. So <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to lay this out. Amen. But uh, I want you to think about fear as being kind of a spectrum. This, this emotion. Now you've got some folks who are absolutely paralyzed by fear. It hinders everything they do. They are locked down because what if? And then you have on the other side of the spectrum, those who run, now nobody think of me, okay? Who run headlong without any thought whatsoever. Who have not, who have not even acquainted themselves yet with fear. Now, those of us, now believe it or not, I am developing some of this, okay? <laughs> uh, you know, ATV accidents and, and dirt bikes and all these, those things will teach you a thing or two. And those of us who look on, you, you might, it might appear on the surface that the source of those people on this side of the spectrum is, is sheer ignorance, but I'm here to I'm here to tell you something altogether different. I think, yeah, ignorance can promote some of that. No question about it. They don't know any better, right? They, they don't know enough to know that they should be afraid. But I think that you can get close, you can, you can get closer to this side if you can somehow over, uh, overcome those things that cause you to be paralyzed. So what, what am I saying? What I'm trying to tell you is that, that this side is just as bad as this side. That you can't be paralyzed. You can't, you can't restrict everything by fear and by all of, but if you through your own experience can, can somehow overcome, uh, what, what, for instance, uh, standing, uh, you know, some of you may have the, the, the fear of stage fright or, or being up in front of folks and talking. I know my brother had that challenge years ago and, and when he went to, uh, um, what to, it was his, his graduation. He was up supposedly praying the, uh, the opening prayer. And he stood behind this pulpit. It wasn't this pulpit, it was the other one, but stood behind here, saw all the people, and he froze. He couldn't, he couldn't say a word. And pastor had to stand up and, and commence the prayer. <laughs> um, so, but obviously he's gotten over that because he's preached here a few times since then. And, and, and he does a fantastic job. But, and the, the point that I'm trying to say is that he could never have achieved that, that success in ministry. It was a necessary thing for him to overcome, to, to manage. It couldn't paralyze him anymore. He had to get past that. Obviously, you don't just come onto the platform completely un unprepared and just run up here and I hope everything works out all right. No, you, you need to put in the work that's necessary. But, but if we can somehow tie these two together and find a good balance, then that, I believe, is necessary. In fact, I believe that is scripturally necessary. I'm not just up here uh, philosophizing, okay? I'm trying to, I'm trying to help you guys. Uh, I, wanted, I wanted to paint that picture here tonight. Paul wrote to Timothy. He said in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, he, uh, for, what, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You might think that Paul is con contradicting everything that I've taught up until this point, that, that we ought not to have anything to do with fear. There's another passage of Scripture that says, perfect love casts out all fear. But... If we take a closer look at what Paul is telling Timothy, what he's telling him back on uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, God did not give us a spirit of, of fear. This word that was translated fear is uh, 
a Greek word, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but it means timidity, fearfulness, or cowardice. It is not, it is not just a general sense of terror, but it is specifically a fear that is driven from being unsure, unstabilized, timid, and cowardice. Of course, John and Paul are absolutely right. I, I, I would not be one, I, I wouldn't even be considered uh, an authorized preacher if I were to stand behind this pulpit and contradict what Paul and, and John taught. But I want you to understand the distinction that Paul and, and John are teaching in 2 Timothy and in 1 John when they talk about this fear that, that should not be in the children of God. But, but, but uh, we, we ought to ensure that there is, no, there is no timidity, there is no cowardice in the people of God. If I finish this series of lessons and, and this church walks out of these doors thinking that we ought to kowtow to every spirit of hell or, or we, ought to be, we ought to be timid, then I have failed my job. Amen. But if I could try to convey to you that if we could somehow find this balance of managing our fear and orienting it not towards our coworkers, not towards these other, uh, these other sources of fear, in fact, I believe there should be no other source of fear than the fear of God. Psalms 118 verses 4 through 6 says, Let them now, I'm just going to read through a few of these, that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. I called upon the Lord in distress. This is, these are those who are facing Fearful circumstances. I called upon the Lord in distress, and the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. And then what did he say? This is verse number six. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. I had the fear of the Lord, he said at the beginning, but, not, but I won't fear because I have the fear of God. I have no reason to be afraid of anything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12 through 15 tells us, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. These statements are, they appear to be somewhat contradictory. You got fear on one hand, but, but he's saying you shouldn't be afraid. And what, he's, what I'm trying to help you understand is that these are those uh, who have found the balance uh, of orienting uh, their fear, that, that, that emotion that God has created within them to, to, to serve him, to be sanctified by him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hebrews 13, verse 6 says, So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Hallelujah. We ought to be emboldened when we, have some, when we have figured out how to orient this fear to God and God alone. Then everything else that we are fearful of ought to fade away. We ought to, it ought to instill within the people of God uh, a genuine boldness uh, to go about uh, and do what God has bid us to do. Amen. Come hell or high water. Amen. Come mountain or valley. Come river or sea. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's. I believe this is a direct result of, of being fearful of God in the appropriate sense. In the, 
I want to provide an illustration for you in this other way to drive this point home. In the investing world, you have a concept of those who are, again, that spectrum. You got those who are risk averse and those who are risk seeking. And both of them have very, have different, uh, different motives. They have different reasons for doing, for, uh, for landing at whatever the dis their disposition is. But those who are risk averse, they, they only like to save. And, and their desire is that when they go to the bank or they go to their, their investor or they go to liquidate that asset, that they can retrieve from that investment what they placed into it. They're not looking for much more. I mean, good if it gets 1% or 2%. That's a safe investment. And they can get back what they put into it. Those who are risk-seeking, however, I mean, the old trope goes that greater the risk, the greater the reward. Those who are willing to, to lose something, and friend, they will lose something. But if they are willing to, and they say that those, those who invest in this risk-on or in these risk-on assets is, is what they're referred to as, that, that you ought to be willing to lose every dime you put in that investment. But the hope is that they diversify. They do more than just one, typically. And, and so they inv invest in this one, this one, and this one. And perhaps it's not a lot. Maybe it's just $100 here, $100 here, $100 here. They lose 200 But this one becomes way more profitable than these other two. And when they finally go back to the bank to ask for their money, when they finally go back to bring the cash out of the bank, then they are, they, they are hoping that this investment has outperformed all of the other investments. That's what, that's what purpose of this is. And I'm here to tell you tonight that God has done the exact same thing with us. He has invested into this church and into various individuals based on his knowledge about what your performance is like. You are an individual. Amen. You are an asset to God. You are his investment in his kingdom. And he knows that this one is a little bit more risky than this one. And he knows that, and he talks about it in another parable, I didn't even include, but the parable of the sower, that some bring back 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. Amen. But you know, notice in that story that three out of four of those investments uh, have all gone to nothing. The, the, the seed on the road and the, and the seed in the thorny bushes and the, and the other seed that, that was planted by and plucked away, amen, by the birds. Those investments were completely unprofitable. But there were some that were planted in the field and got buried and got protected. And it was profitable at varying levels of profit, profitability. But the, the parable that I had in my notes here in Matthew chapter 25, I just want to read this to you. Verses 14 through 25 tells us, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to to his several ability. That word several is an important word. Doesn't mean his different abilities. It means his own ability. His natural ability. God knows what you and I can produce for him. He knows what our, our various characters are are and are the the amount of profitability that each of us have and so he's invested into each and every one of us the amount that he's willing to entrust us with based on our several ability and the bible says he straightway took his journey verse 16 then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents wow Verse 17, and likewise, he, he that had received two, he also gained an other two. But he that, he that had received one 
went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he, he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me five talents. Behold, I gained beside them five talents more. Right down to business. Take a look, Lord. Look at this, look at this portfolio. We've doubled it. 2x. And the Lord looks at him. And he responds, we're on verse 20, so, uh, yeah, verse 21, thank you. Uh, His Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And he also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. Again, right to business. Here's here's what the investment was all about. I want you to be a profitable servant. I want you to bring to me not just what I have put into you. Don't just bring back to me what I have invested in you, but you must multiply. You must be edified yourself. You must become more than what I have put into you. You must put forth effort based on your experience and your knowledge and and your efforts. And you must put yourself to task and bring back more than what I put into you. I fear, church, that, that in this day and age, that, that, the, that the modern Pentecostal church has become far too blasé about what God has invested into us. Hallelujah. Far be it from me that when God comes back that I'm just the same old little boy that was raised on carpeted pews. I want to be far more than just a Pentecostal boy. Amen. That is that that meets the expectations of every person in this place. But I want to do what God wants me to do. He's not just looking for servants. You hear me tonight? He's not just looking for servants. Those are a dime a dozen. You can get. You can. Go anywhere and find anybody to do it. I, I have recently entered to, back into the professional corporate world. I, I don't refer to my business as a professional corporate business historically because there was nothing professional about it. <laughs> I had a lot to learn. But um, I came back to my, my new workplace, started that in January. And I... And I'm blown away by the laziness. I hope this doesn't get to some of them. <laughs> that, just, that just exists. And it's acceptable. Say, things that were assigned months ago, from the day I got on, still left undone. And I think that uh, well, I don't know any other way. That laziness is, is more than just in the corporate world. I think it's a social thing. I think it's more than just this. I've seen contemporaries of mine who wouldn't even be willing to go cut some grass. I mean, yeah, it's hot. Yeah, babe, it gets muggy outside. You're going to sweat. Now, I'm not talking about you, Andreana, so... Please don't. I might be sleeping on the couch tonight. That is not what I meant. Anyway, let's move right along. But it's moving beyond. It's it's has pervaded our society, and can I say, has entered into churches. We come to church and we kick back and like, oh, okay. Well, I hope this is a good service tonight. 
thank God for this church that came to this service. And before the first song was open, uh, finished, that, that it, actually before the first song was open, we had a, mem- a group of people in this front and in their respective pews praying and calling out to God. Doing exactly what the preacher said on Sunday. Stirring up that fire before service ever got started. I'm glad I'm a part of a church that is, is not lazy about the things of God. That wants to be profitable. That wants to make every second count. Yeah, I know things get tiresome. I know things get, you get weary. Amen. But as soon as you realize that, put it off. As soon as you understand that, hey, I am, I am becoming uh, too comfortable. I am becoming too, too, too lazy. Amen. Put that thing off and, and get into the, into the saddle, if you will, and get to work. Do something for God. Don't be the same today that you were yesterday. And don't be the same tomorrow what you are today. Amen. You've got to become a profitable, profitable, profitable servant. Hallelujah. I'm serious about living for God. I don't want to just make it. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible tells us, uh, amen, that there's going to come a day that that if the Lord didn't have mercy on us and come back, uh, that even the elite would struggle to make it. Hallelujah. I want to be among those, the elite. Does anybody feel that way tonight? Hallelujah. Amen. That that means we stop comparing ourselves among ourselves and we start comparing with the only, most, the ultimate. Amen. Christ himself. God, I've got such a long, long, long way to go. I've got so much to learn. I've got so much to do. Hallelujah. When I think about the harvest, Brother Nelson, amen, the burden that you have, I pray God get to me, impart to me, amen, some of the burden that Brother Nelson carries, amen, some of the burden that Bishop carries, some of the burden that Sister Riggin carries. Give me a burden, God, and more than a burden, amen, but a drive, amen, to get me out of bed, amen, and to the presence of God, amen, so that I could see some, so that I might win some. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Do you feel that way tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah, but finally we come to the last servant who different story altogether. Uh, Verse 23, his Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. I've heard pastor mention this many times. He's not going to say well done. If you haven't done well, you're not going to hear those words unless you are doing what he says that you are doing. Hallelujah. Verse 20. Four, he says, then he, which had received one talent, came and said, Lord, I knew. I knew that thou art a hard man. Now, first of all, the thing, first thing I notice is that this guy, you can tell he's lazy. Because he immediately starts making excuses. Well, I just didn't understand. I don't think that, I didn't, I, I knew, God, that you were, I knew you were just a hard, hard, hard man. And in fact, you can see how, how ignorant he is in these next couple of scriptures, or next couple of phrases. He says, reaping where thou hast not sown. How is that even possible? Gathering where thou hast not strawed. You know what this is telling me, Pastor? It's telling me that this guy has never been in the field. He's never been out there working. He said, I don't even know where this stuff comes from. Maybe I'm being too hard. Maybe I'm not. I don't know. Maybe that's the point. This is a parable after all, okay? Every word matters. But he starts out by saying, you, you are a hard man. And so, because you're a hard man, 
Verse 25, he says, I was afraid. Now, I, I, this is a very subtle, but I think important distinction. He didn't say I was afraid of you, but I was afraid. Because he knew what kind of man he was. He knew that he was not profitable. So what did he do? He said, he went and hid thy talent in the earth. He said, I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there hast thou that is, the, that is thine. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. In other words, I did what I knew, I knew to do. And that was what? Protect myself. I protected. I didn't, I didn't want to come off as, as being the one who lost everything. So I didn't even put anything in, put any work in. And this is clearly the point of this parable, that we ought not to be like this particular servant. If there was any question about it, you could read the next couple of scriptures. I don't have them included tonight, but he talks about how he was a wicked and unprofitable servant. This was a, Jesus called this man who is not willing to put in the work wicked and unprofitable. And he said, take what you have hidden, take what you have buried and give it to the one who is profitable. I know he's going to do something with it. Hallelujah. Amen. If we're not careful, we can develop the same attitude that this servant has developed that, well, he only gave me one talent. He only gave me one. He, it's, it's clear that he doesn't think much of me. Because, because, you know, he gave him two. He gave him at least two. And he gave him five. And he gave me one. And so in an effort to preserve his own image of who he was, that, you know what, I'm not going to lose this. He totally missed the point of what his what his purpose was. He totally misunderstood. I am not just a servant for servant's sake. I'm not here just for a title. I'm not here to just be on the ranch and eat the food. But I'm here to take what God has given to me and I am going to make it profitable. If it's one talent, I mean, so be it. I'm going to take this and take it as far as it will go. Yes. Hallelujah. Somebody in this place needs to hear what I'm telling you tonight. That you need to be willing to risk it. That you need to be willing to get out of your per per paralysis by fear. Amen. And do something for the kingdom of God. You say, amen, that he's a hard man. Amen, that he's hard to please. Amen, that the laws are many and strict. Amen, that that church is a legalist church. Amen, that their holy standards are, are strict. Amen, but what are you doing with what you've been given? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, if, if I can, if, 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 it's just a Tory come up here. If, if, if this service can serve, I mean, to dislodge someone who's been frozen by fear and intimidation. Hallelujah. 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 In preparation for this this afternoon, amen, I felt like the Holy Ghost whispered in my ear, amen, I'm one of those one talented people. I don't have a lot. I can only focus on one thing at a time. But as the Holy Ghost moved into my office this afternoon, he wants me to tell you that you got to get to work. Amen. He is coming back. You say you fear him, amen, but what will you do when he returns? Ooh. Hallelujah. Don't sit there with your one talent, amen. Don't sit there. Get, get home and, uh, and get the shovel out and get that thing out of the ground and go to the bank, go to the market, go somewhere and do something for God. How do you get to play? Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know about you, but I have.
have some kind of fear for God. I don't want him to come back and me just be digging this out of the ground. I want him to see more than what he put into me. I want him to see a young man who's been changed. I mean, if we could all stand together. I mean, that's been rearranged. Brother Nelson, he's done so much for me. He delivered me from so much. Bishop's been here for 28 years. Thank God for this precious gift. Thank God for this precious gift over here who is willing to put up with an impatient, risk-seeking, ignorant, underdeveloped, good-for-nothing, liar, thief, Thank God for the gift of my pastor and his wife, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and the gift of this church. Friend, don't go home and bury this. Don't take this home tonight and just lay on your pillow and just say, well, He screeched a little more than he should have. He, he wore his voice down too early in the message. Yeah, you're right about all on all accounts. I'm just coming to you tonight with a burden. There are souls to be won. We have a multiplying to do. We have some bearing to do. We have some fruit to produce. you need to get under a burden for this church what's going on this weekend is a big deal what God is doing in this church is a big deal what God is doing through Bishop in Africa is a big big deal unprecedented revival Brother Nelson, the kind of revival that, that would be written about in, in books. And I believe, as Elder Herring said on Sunday night, that God wants to do the same thing here. Do you believe that tonight? Do you believe that? I think we have enough here on these pews, Brother Nelson, where 30 and 60, there have been some seeds that have fallen away. Birds have come by and, sown and, and plucked away the promises of God. The thorns of life and the thistles of life have, have, have squeezed out for some promises of God. The sun has, has looked down and just the weariness of life has scorched away all hope, every dream. I'm here to tell you there's still some that remain. There's a remnant in this sanctuary right now that still hold, Bishop, to your vision. That still believe in the vision that God has placed on this man who delivered it so clearly to this church over 20 years ago. Oh, I'm not ingratiating myself to Bishop. I'm trying to get you to see what I'm talking about. Do you fear God enough? Are you willing to put forth the effort to change? To become? I'm telling you right now in this sanctuary, those of you who are weary, you can come in these altars and God will give you rest for your soul that you haven't had in many, many years. <laughs> of you who've been working on something in your life. If you come to these altars, uh, the Spirit of God, uh, the Word of God uh, has been sent to edify you and to build that missing component to prepare you, amen, so that you can multiply, so that you can bear after your kind to do the key, the work.